Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tradesman Experience. This is the podcast built by Tradesman for Tradesman. My name is Josh, and across the table is, of course, Mr. Nate Newton. Nate, how are you, sir? Very ready to introduce the uh, audience with this lovely voice I have going on. I'm going to I'm gonna have to turn you up or down or yeah. on. I don't know what. <laughs> I'm already turned down, buddy. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Just, uh, you know, we'll do the old uh, Howard Stern thing, you know, just lay the speaker down on the, uh, on the floor, floor and sit on it. Yeah. Huh. All right, hang on, let me go get yeah. my speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Can't do that anymore. Everybody's got those little JBL things now, you know. You and I have been. I feel like we've been volleying this back and forth. The dude. reality is, it is just latched on. Yeah, I, dude, I get better and then I get worse. Mm-hmm. I get better, I get worse, and it's like I'm constantly intoxicated on some sort of fucking Nyquil, Dayquil, something, mm-hmm. something is stimulating me in one direction or the other. Today, as I was um, medicating myself. <laughs> I had the thought of, I wonder if I'm going to go through withdrawal. When you come off of it? Yes. Yeah. Because in, I don't know, two weeks or whatever, I'm on my, I think my fourth bottle of Dayquil and my third box of Sudafed. Mm. And I don't so, even measure it out anymore. I just drink it straight out of the bottle. Me like, too. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that cup yeah. is even for. Yeah. I throw it away the moment yeah. I open it. I was like, it. are you supposed to pee in this? Yeah. <laughs> for your failed drug test. <laughs> so... I'm like, I'm hoping, hopefully I'm not building up a, uh, an addiction mm-hmm. to the Sudafed. <laughs> it's, uh, th- it's nasty. I'm worried it's about the diabetes nasty. from the fucking cough drops. Yeah. It's constant. I constantly have cough drop in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't. Um, that's what's interesting about the virus is it started off the same, but the lingering effects are different. Mm-hmm. Like your cough is pretty consistent, as everyone will get to enjoy throughout mm-hmm. this conversation. Oh, yeah. Like they did the last two episodes. <clears throat> Mine is more um, sinus pressure and mm. cognitive function. Oh. So, well, that's just because you're 40. One. <laughs> I was like, and? and? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, it uh, yeah. affects an so old body. It's called more. senility, Josh. <laughs> Don't, don't don't say. Don't worry. I'll, I'll remind you again next week. I say don't say words I can't spell <laughs> or define. Yeah. <laughs> God. So I'm chugging my fit aids per the norm, making sure I hydrate. I saw that you have uh, the element, um, the element T on above your desk today. Yeah, the electrolytes. The electrolyte sodium, big yeah. sodium. Yeah. And I I discovered that at the gym probably a month ago. Mm-hmm. They have them on the shelf. You can purchase them. Mm-hmm. And out of curiosity, I just picked one, bought it, dumped it into my, my big water container. Mm-hmm. And it was like Jesus water. It yeah. was delicious. Dude, it beats a fuck out all those like sugar mm-hmm. ass Gatorades and mm-hmm. whatnot. So I, I picked up on it a couple of years ago. Uh, the ex-wife had turned, up, turned me on to it. We started keto. And uh, when you do keto, most of your minerals and electrolytes are stored in the carbohydrates that your body's using. So you kind of have a mineral deficiency. Dude, that stuff fucking pulls you right out of it. Yeah. You know, and that's great for hangovers. Is it? Oh, dude. I get up in the morning if I was like tied one on and I'll down one of those. And then 15 minutes later, I'll down another mm-hmm. one. Fucking right as rain. Ready? Yeah. I found it to be an exceptional post workout drink. Mm hmm. Ooh, I work out. <laughs> <laughs> Sweating, yeah. depletion, yeah. Uh, kind of a hydration, sodium, potassium, <clears throat> electrolyte combination, you yeah. know, post workout, and it just makes it taste better. Yeah. Yeah. Do that chili mango ones and shit. Yeah. I haven't yeah. tried that one yet. I'm mm-hmm. kind of hung up on the citrus salt. Mm-hmm. So, the, the watermelon one, like we were talking about yeah. earlier. You didn't really like it, but it reminds me of being a kid and putting salt on watermelon. watermelon. Yeah, the orange salt's really good. Mm-hmm. I like that yeah. one too. Yeah, the uh, yeah, dude. I find, speaking of the gym, like I've I've gone at least the last two days, but I went almost three weeks without mm-hmm. going. It was fucking killing me. I, I like, haven't been oh, since I uh, got this mm-hmm. plague. <laughs> got a syphilitis. <laughs> got a syphilitis. <laughs> <laughs> got her syphilitis. That's what. That's it what yeah. it is. That's yeah. that's how it's the new version. Yeah, I haven't gotten it, so I postponed my membership because of it. Mm-hmm. I just any cardiovascular exercise right now yeah because well, it's so it's so respiratory yeah because i've stayed in the gym <laughs> since we did 75 hard like mm-hmm. i haven't really mm-hmm. taken any time off and 
Like I realized how fucking dependent I am on that. Like I fucking need it in my life. I have to have it. So like those three weeks of not being in the gym, I lost 20 pounds. For some reason I couldn't eat. Like I, I had to force down mm-hmm. one can of chicken noodle soup a day. Yeah. Same. Was, no like, appetite. No appetite whatsoever. So like I lost like 20 <clears throat> pounds and I just feel like schmoll, you know, like I feel like Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> Your skeletal structure will never allow no, you no, no, I would to die. be the size of no, a hunter. No, I would die. Yeah. yeah you would be in pieces. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't even, I think my bones probably weigh more than You'd be than in that blue is. barrel and Dahmer's apartment. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. be that small. <laughs> yeah. Man. T- tonight's conversation comes from a message that I got from our friend Sonny. Mm-hmm. When someone, anytime someone sends me a podcast, a book, a quote, I I dive into it. Mm-hmm. I, I read the book. I listen to the podcast. I <clears throat> So she sends me this. Uh, I don't know if it was a sh- shared post, I guess. And it's not me, wasn't it? I, she, maybe I don't. Mm. Maybe I, that's how I sent it to you, yeah. I think. But she, okay. she, I think she shared it to me as an act, uh, a post. And I'm always excited when someone asks for our opinion. <laughs> mm. Oh, because we'll give it to you. <laughs> we will. Yeah. Unfiltered, uncensored, <laughs> right here. Gonna say fuck a bunch. <laughs> so I I kind of wrote out most of the post that she sent me to kind of share to kick off because I thought it was again, it's one of those perceptions or topics that I feel like we have brushed against, mm-hmm. but we've never dove excuse me, dove into it specifically. I'm like, well, this is, I think this is a good conversation. So this is the kind of the synopsis of the post. It said, being good at your job often attracts more work. Overworking your high performers to avoid growing your underperformers is a fast track to disaster. Mm -hmm. It breeds resentment. Be very careful of the behaviors and standards we reward. And the reason I say is we, I feel like we've brushed up against that is we kind of talk about, I feel like we kind of beat up low performers pretty consistently. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, Oh, are you on time? Are you organized? Are Mm -hmm. you communicating? Are you fucking complaining all the time? We haven't really talked about the negative side of high performance, Mm -hmm. which this is this she sent me is is called performance punishment Mm -hmm. because i think we we also like have it in our heads that that, like that's not how we operate right Mm -hmm. we don't do that but most places do do that you Mm -hmm. know do do yeah (laughs) yes i'm a fucking child i understand (laughs) Uh, um but we're you know we're all about rewarding on the positive punishing on the negative right Mm -hmm. and so like you know, we're we're not going to go into a, a situation with a team and treat them that way, mm-hmm. right? But that is normalcy. Yeah. So I like what you said. You said we um, we reward on the positive and punish on the negative. Punish on the negative. <laughs> this is punishing the positive and essentially rewarding the negative. Yes. Like, oh, you suck at this. We're not going to have you do anything. And they're going to talk about it. Yeah. We're not going to address it. Instead, we're going to funnel work towards the high performer mm-hmm. and not pay them any more money. Okay, <laughs> good. No, I'm 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 glad you brought that up too because uh, you and I. This was one of the the topics or conversations that <clears throat> uh, you and I really didn't have a kind of a pregame on. So mm-hmm. you saying that, I'm like, yeah, that's where my mm-hmm. mind went too. Right. <clears throat> to to kind of talk about the last three years, right? Uh, the pandemic in 2020 up till now, one of the things that I've seen happen with companies is this, this right. performance punishment, right? They, they're they um, you know, laying people off or, um, you know, firing people, minimizing, downsizing, scaling, especially through the first year or two. Mm-hmm. And they're getting the same amount of work done. They're, they have more expectations, not necessarily higher. Okay, right. there's a, I want to yeah. clarify that more expectations from their performers without additional compensation. Mm -hmm. So you have one person doing the job that three people were doing prior for the same money. Right. Chicken shit. Yeah. Fuck you. 
complete chicken shit. Right. Well, I mean, we saw yeah. that. I mean, I, I think the problem lies in that uh, we kind of touched on it a while ago. I can't remember if it was on the weld.com podcast or if it was on this one. But we, you know, it was like, oh, uh, nobody wants to work anymore. And it's like, well, they don't want to go into these shitty fucking environments that most of these people provide. And that's a shitty fucking environment Mm -hmm. right there. You know, like you look at, you know, once we were coming out of the pandemic, everybody was hiring, right? Fucking, what was it? Jack in the Box was offering like $17 an hour. Food champions. Yeah. 17 bucks an hour. Right. Food champions. That's That's what they called it, man. That's so fucking dumb. (laughs) So dumb. But, uh, you know, like that place was still operational and they had half of the fucking staff. Mm -hmm. So they had to do that to attract them, but you're starting to see those places fall apart again. And it's because they, they've done nothing for culture. They've done nothing to promote high performers. They've literally taken the people that are halfway capable and Mm -hmm. dumped everything onto their fucking plate. Mm -hmm. Who the fuck wants to do that? Right. Nobody, nobody wants to be in that position because at, at some point the, the currency of work outweighs the, Re, the reward, yeah. the, mm-hmm. even the monetary, even if you are paying, eventually, <clears throat> the, you will you, you will erode those people. Mm-hmm. You're gonna wear them the fuck you're out. You're gonna wear them down. You're gonna wear them out because, <clears throat> e, you know, and even if you are compensating them, you're still not addressing the problem. Mm-hmm. And this performance punishment is well, w- we will pay you more because we want you to do more. But high performers operate in a capacity of of high performing teams. Mm, they need support. They do, and they need people around them. Even even if the role is a supportive role to their position, they still need that. But but those supportive roles still know how to play. They still know how to perform. They still understand what the expectation is. They're not off operating at a a different level that's unacceptable. Mm. So that erosion sets in and burnout sets in. That's what I tell people when when we start talking about burnout. I said burnout is a result. Mm-hmm. It's burnout's not a condition. It's not causation. Yeah. No, it, it is a result mm-hmm. of so many things that happened. And this performance punishment creates that, creates mm-hmm. that burnout, creates that. So you know, when uh when Sonny sent this to me <clears throat> and I read it a few times, I said, Well, I I, I actually agree with him. I, I, I agree with the post, but this isn't the problem. Mm-hmm. Chicken shit leadership yeah, is the problem. Leadership is the fucking problem. That's right. Yeah. I do. I mean, anybody that owns a business, think back to you've done this at some point. You have been so in the fucking weeds in your business and mm-hmm. you have leaned on your highest performer and fucking got real close to losing them. Yeah. Like we did it with Grant. Mm-hmm. We were putting Grant in places he shouldn't have been, putting all the shit on his plate that wasn't for him. Mm-hmm. You know, like I think even that, like, you know, this performance punishment, you're putting shit on their plate of stuff they're probably not that good at. You know, like, like we try to make sure that we put people in the right places and get them doing the right job and capitalizing on their, on their, um, the f- what the fucking word I'm looking for? Strength. Strength. Jesus fucking Christ. God damn it. <laughs> COVID brain. <laughs> but, um, and that's, that's really where you start to burn people out. Put them in places where they shouldn't fucking be. Yeah. The, a flaw of a high performer is they're not going to say anything. No bitching allowed, right? Nope. They're just going to do it. Mm-hmm. They're just going to do the work because that's the expectation. They're going to fucking hate you for it. Yep. Mm-hmm. But they won't complain and they won't tell you that they hate you for it. Mm-hmm. They will They will just continue to expend themselves at, at, a, at a rate that they, that's not a sustainable. Mm-hmm. Right. You're, you are correct. You have to put people in areas of their strengths, not comfort. Two different things. Uh, you have to put people in areas of their strength and push their comfort zone. But when you depend on them for 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 too much, when you believe that they have all oh, they have all of these strengths, all oh, they'll get it done, they'll figure it out, and they take that weight off of you, you become codependent mm-hmm. on that individual, 
And when that codependency sets in, the quality of the relationship starts to deteriorate mm -hmm. because now they feel like you're just using them. Right. I will tell you, you know, as a both a leader and a follower in my uh, career, I know I was guilty of this as a leader. Mm -hmm. When I think back to a couple of my install crews, I think that, that that's a really good example. The first install crew being Matt was mm -hmm. when he was in my company. So that that wasn't the guy that was the high performer though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I had him and Chad, mm -hmm. they became the, this fucking power team mm -hmm. of just getting shit done. And I was like, oh, man, Chad can do it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so every time there was something popped up, you know that you can send those two yep. motherfuckers, you don't have to think about it. But here's the mistake that I made is I continued to elevate my expectation of what they could do mm -hmm. without their buy-in. Right. Did they meet it? Every fucking time. Mm -hmm. But I didn't get their buy-in. I didn't have conversations with them. I wasn't compensating them accordingly. There was a lot of things that I was doing wrong, but I was just depending on them to get it done because that was the result mm -hmm. that I needed. I just needed to get it done. The second time was actually with my other brother, my youngest brother, TJ. Him and Tyler were my young team, and they were far outperforming the other crew. And they actually voiced and came to me, and they said, you know, you're holding us to this standard, but the other install crew isn't meeting that standard. So mm -hmm. why is that tolerated? Why right. is that allowed? They were asking me this question that we're talking right, about right. because they, they were just like, look, we, this doesn't make sense to us. Mm -hmm. You're expecting us to do this, but you're allowing them to do this. So I experienced it on a leadership level. And, you know, especially looking back now, it's like, oh, yeah, I did all of these things wrong. Mm -hmm. I know from a personal coming up through the career, this was one of the main reasons I would leave a company. Mm -hmm. This right here. Right, right. Is because I was always given the opportunity to perform at the highest level without compensation. Mm -hmm. And without anyone else also right. needing well, to meet a standard. Because like the statement, you know, it sounds like it, you're like, oh, that's a corporate setting mm -hmm. all day. And it's like, no, all of us in small business, we fucking do it too. We don't do it at the, you know, emotionless level that a corporation does. But mm -hmm. we still do this, you know, and it's I think if you if you approach business the way that we talk about on this podcast, you're not going to do this shit right here. You know, like it takes some fucking up. You know, mm -hmm. but once you course correct and you really take care of those people and, and start to make the adjustments, like, dude, Grant's on, Grant's fucking crushing it right now. You know, he was the guy that we did that to. And then uh, we had his eval um, on Monday or mm -hmm. Tuesday. And he was like, dude, this is the happiest I've been in a long time. Like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and at, at some, there's going to be a conversation coming up with you and I, where we talk about that scenario and the importance of understanding positional placement, mm -hmm. who's the best number two, who's the best number three, who's the best number what? Right. Um, because once you find Four that comes after three, just so you know, does. Yeah. Uh, maybe. I don't know. That sounds racist. Yeah. <laughs> is it math racist? I heard that one time. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> that can't fit. It is racist. So. <laughs> it's black and white and mm -hmm. yellow and red. What are we talking about? No. So, hang on, I lost my train of thought. Dude, I'll tell you what, this, COVID fucking, brain, dude, it's this, fucking, this fucking flu yeah. brain, COVID mm. brain, Sudafed brain. Right. Um, it's concoction and oh, drugs around all day. Okay, back, I'm, I'm back. Yeah. I know where okay. I'm at. So, so, it brings me to another point that I, that, that I want to make sure that people don't misunderstand about this is this is, does not say that everyone has to operate at the same level. Right. Yeah. That's not what this is saying. Mm -hmm. What it is saying is that everyone has to operate at a minimal standard, mm -hmm. but that standard needs to be held across the board. It needs to be clear. There needs to be accountability. There needs to be consequences and there needs to be constant uh, growth opportunity and leadership to elevate people up. Mm -hmm. But if you misunderstand this, you may think that, well, you need everyone on your team to operate at the same capacity. And that is 
is equally unfair Mm -hmm. as performance punishment. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, like we've like we've gotten, talked about though, it's it's the putting people where they're with, where mm-hmm. they belong. You can eradicate a lot of this shit by putting people where they're supposed to be. They're still gonna uphold a standard, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's I think that's like that's so hard for leadership to get past. They're like, well, they should be able to do everything at the highest level, and it's like, well, they fucking don't. Mm-hmm. So either your training sucks, or they're humans, <laughs> you know. Like, and that's the part that gets overlooked. It's like people. They're fucking humans. They're not robots. They're not just your fucking employees. They have a yep. brain. It works a certain way. It's your fucking job to go figure out how it works. I was a guest on a podcast recently, and whenever that particular conversation comes out, we'll share the we'll promote it on here. But that was one of the points that I made around leadership training and systematic operation was that a lot of people remove the human factor from that equation Mm -hmm. and they expect them to operate a, B and C and generate result X, Y, Z Mm. and never vary. Right. That, that, that expectation is always that it's, there are no exceptions. The moment you put the human factor in, Mm -hmm. you've got somebody that shows up to work that has a sick child or, had an argument with their spouse or just doesn't feel good Mm -hmm. or some life factor comes into play that is going to alter their performance on some level. Mm -hmm. You have to keep in mind the human factor at all times. And it's one, I think it's one of the really big ingredients that makes leadership the hardest thing you'll ever do because every day is new it's different right. it's a yeah. it's like a goldfish right like every trip around the bowl is a new yeah. adventure well i'm like i always have that statement oh that person was great when they got here then i don't know what happened you happened you i was just yeah. thinking the same thing like yeah. you happened mm-hmm. you you put them in a place you know think of it as if you were to plant something if you don't nourish it feed it allow it to grow and you think about um, plants, animals, whatever. If they're in captivity, they're only going to grow so much. Mm-hmm. Leadership is captivity for growth. Mm. The, the The ceiling of the company, the ceiling of the culture is strictly dictated by the leader. Right. So if you have that environment or that culture of captivity, that's – it's, that's what's going to happen. They were great when they got here. Well, well, now their days are redundant. Right, right. It's just this. Well, there's, there's. I mean, whatever fucking millions of reasons that it went sideways, but you didn't course correct. You didn't do your fucking job, you know, and that's, I, I always love watching people point the finger at their crews, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, fucking these guys would just do this. It's like, dude, you're missing the mark so fucking much mm-hmm. right now. Like and then they find that one motherfucker that does what they expect, and then they do exactly what we're talking about here tonight. They dump everything on them. They're like, "Yeah, these the rest of these guys are fucking idiots." And it's like, "You're still paying them, aren't you?" So who's a fucking idiot here? You know. The other, you know, when that happens, what ultimately you're doing is you're creating an opportunity for that individual to negotiate themselves far out of standard market value. Mm -hmm. Well, then they're going to get out there and they're really going to, their expectations of what they should get paid and what their environment should look like. When they go to leave your ass, you just set them up for the worst kind of Mm -hmm. failure. Their expectations walking out are going to be like, I did all of this. This is what I, you know, because there's no conversation there. So this is what I deserve. And man, they're going to get kicked in the fucking Mm -hmm. mouth when they get out there. Now they're going to start their own company Mm -hmm. and most likely damage the market. Yeah. Most people don't want to have their own company. Mm. And I think business owners have a hard time understanding that. And then business owners are like, well, you know, when I worked for so-and-so, when I was doing all of this, if they would have just paid me more, I would have been happy. Mm. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. Their startup is based in necessity. Mm-hmm. So 
they go through the same motions with their team. They do this. They go, well, once I get that one person, I'll just pay them more mm -hmm. and they'll be happy. Once I find myself out there. <laughs> which is what. You arrogant <laughs> fuck. Which is what. Yeah. That's, uh, everybody makes that hiring mistake. Mm -hmm. Right. They, they look for themselves. And it's one of the things that I try to encourage leaders to say, hey, when you sit down and you create the roles, responsibilities and expectations and you write that out, I said, do not define yourself. Mm -hmm. You're creating a position. If you're defining yourself, then you're, now you're creating a person. You just literally sucked your own dick on paper. <laughs> I mm -hmm. am so good. <laughs> you can... Uh, you, you can understand what the position needs based on your skills and experience, but don't put yourself on paper and then try to look for that person. Mm -hmm. You're creating a position. Because mm -hmm. if they are you, they're going to start their own fucking business anyway. Precisely. Right? Yeah. Which if they are you also, you're not going to like them because they're... Because <laughs> you really don't want to look in that mirror. That you day. don't. Yeah. No, you don't. And they're going to combat everything that you mm -hmm. say. Right. And not that you have to be a yes man, but... Mm -hmm. I tell people, I said, look, you either need to add or multiply mm. when you look at hiring. Okay. If you're going to multiply, then, then you are, then you are bringing somebody on the team that has similar skills that that can basically re replace you at this position. Mm. Now, now you are multiplying your skill set to another individual. If you're adding, then you're bringing people on your team that have strengths and your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's an EFI maybe it's sales regardless if you're adding to your team you're you're bringing on strength and your weaknesses if you're multiplying in your team you're adding strengths and your strengths mm -hmm. and so that's kind of how i look at hiring what's going to be the best position for me do i need to add some add a position or do i need to multiply my my capabilities mm -hmm. and start looking at it that way um Either way, this is very easy to fall into. Because mm -hmm. if, again, if you add someone to your team that is really good at the things that you're bad at, what are you most likely to do? Yeah. Delegate and dump everything you don't want to do mm -hmm. onto that individual. Yeah. And then if you get someone that multiplies your skill set, you're going to dump everything that you don't want to do yeah. onto, that onto that individual. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, uh, you know, that unfortunately, this scenario is mostly a knee-jerk reaction to some change in your business. You know, I, I don't, you know, it, let's say either, you know, you had a job go sideways or you landed more than you thought you could handle. And then you make this knee-jerk reaction, then you never go back to it because it worked for a minute, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't, you, you can't fucking look out far enough ahead to be like, ooh, maybe this, maybe right. this isn't sustainable. So situational performance. Mm -hmm. Right, it all worked. Yeah, this individual stepped up. Mm -hmm. Which performers are going to step up? You will never find a high performer that's going to step back and wait to see if somebody else is going to to step up or not. Mm -hmm. And the book Relentless that we talked about with Shalace and Ken, mm -hmm. he really uh, Tim Grover talks about that pretty in depth in that book, and he looks at it as a closer. God damn it, I can't remember again brain fog but you know a cleaner is his high performance that's the definition of uh, of his high performer um a, a cooler closer and a cleaner mm -hmm. and a cleaner is never going to sit back and let somebody else make the decision mm -hmm. that's what this individual is they're not going to sit back and wait they're mm -hmm. not going to sit back and see if this is okay they're not going to wait to see if you're going to give them help mm -hmm. they're just going to fucking do it yeah that's the this person is the person you hand them something and you don't fucking hear from them until it's done. You know, they're not in there asking you 50 fucking questions. And they're going, well, how do I, or should right. I do this? Or, you know, that, that back and forth shit. And uh, that's kind of one of the cool things that I've started to notice in our, within our organization. My fucking door doesn't open that much anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, especially since we've had Garrett in there, like, there's people in there making fucking decisions and moving in the right direction and just flat out handling shit. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's working. Yeah. You know, we're starting to see the proof in the pudding. And there, there's there's two two pieces that I want to dive into with this, you know, this individual in this situation um, in the performance punishment. The first part that I want to talk about is correcting the behavior of the underperformer. 
Yeah, right. Because as we said earlier, there needs to be a, a minimum standard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You have to define what that acceptable minimal standard is. Mm-hmm. And that needs to be clear. And you need to make sure that everyone in the team is holding that line. Mm-hmm. So as this states, overworking your high performers to avoid growing your underperformers is a fast track to disaster, which is why I made a note that this is chicken shit leadership to me. Mm-hmm. Because instead of having the hard conversation, instead of facing possible confrontation, you just depend on the people to get shit done and you ignore the, the underperformers. Right. So the, the big question is, how do you correct it? Mm-hmm. Right. The first conversation you need to have is with your high performers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what should you not be doing? Right. Give allow them to give you in, their insight of the performance of the team without consequence mm-hmm. and confidentially. Mm-hmm. Allow them to give you insight as performance of the team because. You are obviously blinded because you're giving this individual everything. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a conversation with them and go, okay, we need to get the team to perform better. I feel like I'm relying on you for everything. And I know long-term that's not going to work out well for you and I. Mm -hmm. So if we were to start building this team and elevating the team that we currently have, where do you think we need to start? So I want to get buy-in of my top performer mm-hmm. of and understand where I need to start in elevating the team. Right. Because they, I will tell you, they're very in tune with who is doing what. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the dude just like sweating and bleeding everywhere and there's somebody fucking just poking around on their phone mm-hmm. in the background. Um, I think a lot of people don't understand just how detrimental it is to your business when that motherfucker walks away. You have no plan B. You have no backup. You have nobody to step in and do what you need to be done. Mm -hmm. You know? So what does that narrative sound like? Fucking Nate left. I Mm -hmm. I paid him more. I gave him everything he wanted. Mm -hmm. Every time he asked for time off, I give it to him. He, I give him this, I give him a truck, I give him all that. And he still fucking quit. Mm Mm-hmm. That that becomes the narrative. Right. They don't take any ownership of. There's no self. There's no accountability for the result of that relationship. Mm-hmm. Straight, dude. You fucking blame the other person. Yeah. You can edit this out if you want, but this reminds me of your fucking HVAC company. Mm-hmm. What you were that high performer that everything went onto your desk, and the moment you left, a lot of things changed. A lot of things fucking <laughs> changed, and they hundred percent turnover. Hundred percent turnover in, in nine months. Seven months. And you had the highest performing HVAC techs in the fucking, mm-hmm. probably the state, right? And then. We were, yeah. And yep. then now it's some little. Yeah. It's yeah, it's garbage now. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's like, that's, I feel like that's a great example of mm-hmm. that, you know? Yeah. And, and the truth of that is, oh man, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of facets to that example. One being. The, the the success of the operation became codependent on my ability to lead. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like that was one. Now, there has to be a level of codependency because that's the leader's job. The leader's job is to drive, right. is to navigate, is to is to push, force, mm-hmm. drive, you know, get results. And but it was so codependent, so one sided, very very yeah. you know one sided. Well, because like I that scares me a lot in our business mm-hmm. because I I'm not really. I'm not in the leadership position that Matt is, you know, but I try to keep tabs on it the best I can. And I try to interject myself when I can Mm -hmm. just to get them to realize, Hey, there's two owners here, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But that's like, it's, it's a hard when that's, when you have direct um, roles and responsibilities and that is somebody's role and responsibility, but you still kind of have to watch it in the background and you don't want to be stepping on their toes and be like, Hey dude, you're fucking up here. Like, Mm -hmm. That's that's a difficult conversation to have properly, right? Very. And yeah. I tried it. Mm-hmm. I, I had several. So you saw the ways it didn't work. Uh, I I saw the ways it didn't work because the other the the other individual was not willing to receive any mm. 
any offer of correction, mm -hmm. any alternative methods. Right. Because I don't see you going in there and just motherfucking somebody over that. You know? No, I, you know, I did once. I, I had one conversation uh, where I was, I wasn't, it wasn't pleasant, mm -hmm. but it, the shit that I said needed to be said. Mm -hmm. Everything else that I did in my approach was strategic. Mm -hmm. and, and I had strategic plans of how to correct. Not just this is what we need to do. This is, that, this is how we can do it. And this is how it's going to benefit. And this is the result that's going to create. And, and you know, all kinds of conversations. But when the at, at the end of the day, when the individual who has the majority power mm -hmm. to have the decision isn't willing to modify anything, including their own behaviors and habits, there's nothing you can do. Right. And so I, I was put in this position. Mm -hmm. uh, it was performance punishment. Right. And yes, it cost a lot. It cost a, a lot of livelihoods. It cost a lot of money. It cost a lot of um, stress and <laughs> sanity. Sanity. Right. Uh, you know, it costs a lot. But do you know, <clears throat> at, starting out this way, you know, or even course correcting at the path you're on, you just have to understand that difficult conversations are necessary mm -hmm. because you don't know everything. Well, I mean, if you own a business and you're listening to this, take a good hard look at your team while you're listening to this and be like, am I fucking doing this? Mm -hmm. You know, like, am I, am I leaning on one person too much and yep. not making their time here the most valuable that yeah. it can be? So let's, let's compound that into a little bit larger um, example. Are you relying on one person or are you relying on one department too much? Mm. Because there are some companies that have departments that really finance the uh, another, another side, yeah. yeah, another side that 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 company doesn't need to be doing, or they don't have the right leadership in place, or, or mm -hmm. people on the team. Yeah, uh, do, or that could even work with your fucking clients, dude. Because we got put in that fucking hole. Yeah, you know, we had one client that like most of our work was going through, and it was like you know fucking they had options, you know, and some people were coming in with lower numbers and. Dude, they especially like developmental projects. They have to go with the fucking lower number, mm -hmm. you know? And so like, it's hard for them to sell it sometimes. And we started losing out and losing out. We're like, fuck, we need to diversify our, our contractor pool. Mm -hmm. But then we did that and it like, it's, it, it's the exact same fucking remedy, right. right? Like we went out and found, found other high performing contractors. We still work with that contractor all the time. And they're one of our largest clients. But we need we needed other pools to dip into, yep. you know, and that's that's what happens here. It's interesting how this damages a relationship more than it grows a relationship. Mm -hmm. You would think, I think the perception is, but you would think that well, if you have a relationship with this one company, one contractor, one department, one person, and that you continue to build that, that that's just going to strengthen that relationship. And the reality is, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It can it, it builds stressors in that relationship. It builds codependency. Yeah, that's the thing, dude. They don't want to feel like you're dependent upon them. Like, why do you only work for us? Like, mm -hmm. why aren't you out there working for other contractors? Like, are, they, are we not seeing something everybody else is? And like, no, we just didn't go look for anything. You yeah. Know? But it pushed us. You know, once we decided to diversify our our market pool, that opened up a ton of different markets for us. You know, that's kind of what pushed us big into the custom home game mm -hmm. you know and uh even into the larger scale commercial stuff so it's uh yeah it's that's relevant a, across it the is fucking and i board. think that's a really good example and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you were able to see it like that because it is true it, it's relevant on on multiple different scales mm -hmm. and different uh aspects of business not just you know uh, having a, a person or a team uh, so that that's a really good observation um, so it's like, you know, correcting those, uh, those underperformers, starting with your high performer, having a conversation with them, getting their buy-in, but also their perspective of where, where they think the best place you can start is. And then you start there and you understand that this is going to be a multi-month process. Mm -hmm. You may end up firing someone, mm -hmm. but you're going to have to meet with people individually. Yeah. I mean, you're supposed to be playing the fucking long game here. That's right. You got to be able to see that shit. This is also going to force you to 
create roles, responsibilities, and expectations for every position. Mm -hmm. And so I had a meeting, a uh, lunch meeting before I come down and met with you and Matt today because we're setting up, I'm, do, I'm getting ready to do like some uh, two different leadership trainings with their company also, mm -hmm. like I'm getting ready to do with your company. And I told him, I said, look, here's one of the things I want you to be prepared for. This is going to be one of the questions that I ask. And the question is, can you definitively define your role in this company? It's going to be one of the questions I ask. It's going to be one of the questions I ask your guys. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't give me a definitive answer, there is no answer. Fuck. I think we're going to need to go do some homework <laughs> before we send them over here. <laughs> because creating clarity in that expectation of performance is necessity for growth. Yeah. Well, yeah, because how are you supposed to gauge performance if you don't know what fucking performance is, right? <laughs> so it's like, you know, so asking that question and then, you know, as you go through and you start leading your underperformers, because as we've talked about in offboarding, which was a long time ago, mm -hmm. as we talked about in offboarding, I think that unless they break a non-negotiable, Mm -hmm. That person should be coached before they're fired. Yeah. I believe that thoroughly. This is part of that coaching. You need to lead them mm -hmm. before you fire them. Right. Because if this is happening, this is your fault. Right. So now it's your job to kind of level out that playing field a little bit and elevate the, the underperformers so your high performer can operate more efficiently. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to do that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And you're going to have to create crystal clear expectations, roles, and responsibilities for that individual, and then make sure that they understand what those are, and then evaluate whether or not they're performing that capacity. Mm -hmm. I don't think people understand how difficult it is to delegate. Like, you're like, oh, I just, you know, I, I shouldn't be doing this anymore, so I'm going to pass it off to somebody else. Well, they're not doing it the way that I would want it to be done. Uh the gap. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. The so gap like, between delegation and expectation. Yeah, and trying to fill that void and trying to, to take your fucking self out of it, right? Mm -hmm. That's hard to do. It's hard, you know? Like, you've had something that's worked. And it's like, well, there's, you know, that old thing and more than one way to skin a cat, right? I mean, I've never skinned a cat, but I, I hear there's multiple ways to do it. So. I've been told. Yeah. No, you're right. And... It's like, so how do you remove yourself from that, but also stay involved at, at a level? It's like, it, mm -hmm. it's a tricky balance. And yeah. there is a process to delegation. And part of it starts out with small task delegation that offers you the ability to kind of micromanage some of the process. Mm -hmm. But here's the, here's the secret to that. And this is the piece that mo a lot of people miss. That micromanagement process through small task delegation is about doing one thing, building trust. Mm. Both directions. Yes. That's what that is really about. Because they're not going to comply with your expectations and standards if there is no trust. Mm. So that small task delegation is about building trust. Then once you build trust, you start going up from small task delegation to medium task delegation. Now you're starting empowerment to making and, and continuing to make sure that there's alignment and understanding what that, um, what that expectation and what that standard is and ultimately developing and growing that individual into full task delegation. Mm -hmm. Now you have a fucking leader. Right, right. Now that person can do the same thing with a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I think most people, when they look at delegation, they look at it as a task. They're all oh, delegating this task. It's like, no, 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 you're creating a fucking leader for that. You know, because that's like something we're trying to do right now too. And it's like, you know, the team is getting to that threshold where, you know, it's, it'd be really difficult for Matt to lead eight people, you know, like anybody is going to struggle to lead eight people. So it's like Matt takes on two leaders, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's like, we got our shop guy and our field guy. And it'll get to a point where those guys aren't going to be able to handle whatever there is. So then we'll have to have foremans or superintendents. Mm -hmm. They've got department leaders yeah. and foremen. That's right. right. And realizing that that's what delegation looks like, that mm -hmm. it's creating a leader. It's not creating a, a task you don't have to do anymore. That's right. 
So that's where you have to start with the underperformers, and that's kind of the path you got to take. You have to be patient with it because mm-hmm. you didn't you didn't build this fuck up overnight. Yeah, huh? <laughs> I mean, some <laughs> dude, some people probably you'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah, some of the fuck ups that I've done, I look back and I'm like, dude, how did I do that so fast? <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. And now I've got to remember what my second point was going to be. <laughs> so I can, oh my yeah, God. I'm really good at derailing things. So can, no, man. It's, it's like just I said, the, the brain. Yeah. This, uh, this whole cognitive function thing with this goddamn virus is fucking me up bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, it was, I it forgot was a, there was two points. <laughs> <laughs> I remember those two points. Just having a hard time remembering what the second point was. Uh, oh, fuck. I'm not real sure. It might come to me. <laughs> yeah, on your drive home. Yeah, no yeah. doubt. It was really smart. Yeah. It was really, I, was I actually thought about writing it down <laughs> when you and I were talking a minute ago. Uh, uh, as that's as I'm trying to re uh, to rediscover what that is, um, part of uh, I think something to look for is like, what are some of the identifiers or what are some of the flags to to kind of know if this is going on? Mm-hmm. Um, is that I made a couple notes. It's like one is complacency. Is there complacency in in performance with anybody on the team? Mm. And if if there is, that's because someone else is pulling their weight. Right, right. Right. If you've got somebody that is showing up like at start time and they can't get out of second fucking gear. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just operating at that, you know, stage of complacency. A second one is complaining. Mm. I think complaining is a really good identifier um, that you, there may be some scales tipped here in performance. Mm-hmm. You, now your complaining isn't going to come from your high performer though. Right. It's going to come from the underperformers. Mm-hmm. But uh, recognizing where is the complaining coming from? And what's it aimed at? What's it aimed at? And is there consistency in where it's coming from? Is it from the same department, from the same people? You know, where's that coming from? Um, and then something else that this breeds is poor internal competition. Hmm. Right. Because now everything is a dick measuring contest. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, fucking so-and-so doesn't have to do it. Well, I did this. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't have, you know, so it, it breeds this poor internal competition. Right. If you got people running to you telling you all, all the things they did that day, Mm-hmm. And, and all the things that somebody else didn't do. Right, right. Be like, you little fucker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think that's a good sign, too, uh, to, you know, is there some some heavy uh, unbalance in performance going on? Mm-hmm. It, is somebody, do they have the need to constantly remind you of the things that, that they are doing and what everybody else is not doing? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's a good identifier. When you... Again, when you kind of look at the cultural performance of the team, and you don't even have to have a lot of people for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's just one thing I want people to understand. That I'm not talking about large scale companies here. I'm talking like this couldn't happen with two or three people. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and it does quite often. Oh fuck yeah, it does. Especially when you're starting out, and you don't know what the fuck you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just need this thing done. Right. <laughs> that's some of the most short sighted shit you can possibly do. Too much communication and passing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not, so yeah, so, you know, finding out what those identifiers are. One of the things, uh, you mentioned earlier was, you know, that, uh, you don't necessarily play a leadership role in the operations with the company, but you still have to have some level of involvement. So one of the things that I recommended in, in, uh, our coaching session today was like, you guys need to have a, a weekly leadership meeting. Mm-hmm. You guys have your team meetings on Monday mornings, and that's good. And you, you talk about specific things. You run the team meetings appropriately. Now that you're creating leadership positions in the company, now you need to have a leadership meeting. Mm-hmm. And that is an end of the week type of meeting. Yeah. And that was a question that you asked me. And you said, hey, would that be better fit for the end of the week? Doing that on a you know Thursday or Friday, that way you can recap that week and you can go ahead and start to kind of pre-plan for the next week. schedule built. Because they're mm-hmm. going to be your pulse on the operation, right? They're, they're going to know the ins and outs. They're going to know all that shit that they didn't bring to you. You know, all the stuff that you 
delegated to their leadership mm-hmm. position. It's a shit you don't fucking hear about. Yes. As long as you have empowered them to solve those problems. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, then they can say, hey, this happened. This is how we fixed it. This has happened. This is the conversation that I had. This happened. We had we ordered this or we did this or we had to rework this, whatever. And those those conversations will rarely be an hour. Mm-hmm. They're probably 30 minute meetings. <laughs> it's one of those that nobody really wants to be there. They're like, yeah, 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 we know. Let's let's exchange the information <laughs> and let's fucking get on with it. Transfer information, clear cut agenda. Mm-hmm. Um, what went right? What went wrong? What did we do? What's the plan for next week? And it's very cut and dry. But as you do it, people also become more fluid with it. And then it creates opportunity when when there are situations that require a little bit more attention. And then you you're, you're creating a platform for those conversations. Mm-hmm. I recommended that you be involved in those mm-hmm. in those operational meetings. Right? Is that like those operational meetings are also going to ha- assist me with my bidding process? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like okay, where did we go over? Where were we under? You know, are we hitting our fucking numbers the way we're supposed to be? It's going to help with job costing. You know, it's like that, that is the pulse of the operation. So mm-hmm. that all that shit, I fucking need to know that stuff to know if I'm bidding things properly. So that's, uh, you know, having that extra layer of accountability, mm-hmm. you know, because it's like, oh, we thought we could do it for this amount of time. Did I fuck up bidding or did something happen to where, you know, like a snowstorm fucking buried all of our steel and we spent two fucking days digging everything out? I mean, shit like that, it, it matters, you know. Yeah. Uh, I got to know if we're we're, hit, we're heading in the right direction because mm-hmm. the thing is, I'm six months ahead of everything. So it's exactly. like I've already bid on projects that we're going to do in a year, you know, and I, I got to make course corrections as mm-hmm. quickly as possible. It also continues to generate the understanding, that, and this is how you worded it in our meeting, that there are two owners. Mm-hmm. And back to the example you brought up with my previous company because this is how i performed that i think there became there i don't think i know there was definitely some resentment Mm -hmm. from my partner because the team depended on me right they they followed me because of my capacity as a leader Mm -hmm. and not him because he, he wasn't involved right. in operations. He didn't need to be involved. You don't need to be involved at the same capacity that Matt is in operations, but you need to have involvement. Mm-hmm. Yep. So in those leadership meetings, in the team meetings, having that presence, having those conversations, asking the questions that you can gather information that's going to better equip you to better serve them, to better set them up for success. That way you have this good, uh, this good reciprocating relationship with everyone is is a good role. If you were to not attend those meetings, it would start. It would create divide. Mm-hmm. I'd be the dude in the office. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what's kind of awesome about Matt and I's dynamic too. Is that that whole mom and dad thing that we do? Yeah. You know, I'm dad, and like by the time you get drug in to deal with dad, like yeah. you <laughs> fucked up pretty bad. The belt's coming off, you know. <laughs> But like, uh, like disciplinary shit, like Matt and I split that burden, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I, I fucking hate it. I hate it, but I understand how necessary it is and I know how necessary it is for me to be a part of it, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, and I'm, I hit harder than Matt does. So that helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that was the role that I always played was disciplinary. Yes. Mm-hmm. And as you joke. They, the you guys played the mom dad role. Mm. For us, it was good boss, bad boss. Right, and I was the bad boss. Mm. And that was that. How that, dare you hold me to a standard, you piece of shit? Exactly. Yeah. The other guy doesn't make me do it. <laughs> but but that's <laughs> <laughs> the best is when like they come in and they ask me something. Like we were, I'm sitting there, and one of our greenhorns mm-hmm. came in. And he goes, "Hey Nate, uh, what should I be doing?" And Matt's sitting behind me. And I just turned around and looked at Matt, and Matt's turning around looking at me. And Matt's like, do you fucking know what my job is here? And he goes, oh, yeah, sorry. I'm like, so when that when that example came up, and the, the quick sidebar here, but it's 
I, I appreciate it when you guys shared that with me because we're I was in a coaching session with just you and Matt and and you shared that story with me. My immediate question was how many things went wrong in a row for that to be the option. Right. Right. I said I didn't even say a word. Right. I just looked at that and I'm like, he's got it. <laughs> <laughs> so creating that those new leadership positions, as I explained to Matt today, I said, you, the, 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 the lowest person, and I don't mean lowest, but for lack of a better term, your, um, your, your greenhorn, your FNG mm. should not have to come to you for hour by hour operations mm -hmm. for what's the next step. That should not be happening right, right now. If you have a team of six to eight people, mm -hmm. nobody should be in there asking you what they're. You have a shop, you have a field leader and you have a shop leader. Yeah, that's who I said. Now and so I was in your office today. Very rare. You had one guy in there who who happened to be the FNG, mm -hmm. and nobody else in there. He's going to come and ask Matt. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. that's the direct line of communication. Right. Right. That's an exception. There's no to other the option. That's right. Yeah. That's an exception to the rule. It's not the rule. Mm -hmm. And then that's like, we want him in there asking the questions because we don't want him to like accidentally wall his dick to the table or mm -hmm. something, you know, which is always a possibility, you know? So, <laughs> Apparently. Never fucking know. Apparently. I've yet to see it. it happen. No, no, I yeah. haven't, but I, I'm not a welder. Yeah, so. I used to tell Grant that every time I'd leave the shop if I left him <laughs> yeah. there by himself. I'm like, don't weld your fucking dick to the table this time. He's like, dude, it sucks. It keeps getting shorter every time I have to cut it off the table. <laughs> it keeps getting shorter. Yeah. I guess I just started out on the opposite end. I never <laughs> don't worry about it. <laughs> so does it is that a belly button? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? So funny story. Yeah. Is, uh, I had no idea what the fuck my second point was going to be. <laughs> we'll, so, we'll, so, we'll, we'll, br we'll brush it in there at some point. Yeah, so we may have a part two mm -hmm. to this whenever uh, my, my brain connects those two wires back together. Uh, and I know I was talking about the how, but I still had no idea what I was going to say about the high performer part. So, not surprised. I can't um, wait for that text message from you at 9 o'clock tonight. I'd be like, yeah. oh, dude. Oh, God dude, damn it. found Here it. it is. Here it is. But, so, since I'm not going there, uh, to kind of circle this all the way back around, performance punishment is a real thing. And... You also have to make sure as a leader that you're not self-inflicting this. Mm. Yeah. That you're not putting yourself mm -hmm. through performance punishment because you don't know how to delegate. You don't know how to dif have difficult conversations. You haven't set clear expectations, roles, and responsibilities. You're just enabling people yeah. uh, to behave. And your ego won't let you do it. And your ego won't let you do it. Yeah. I'm the, I'm the fucking boss. I gotta do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I should be working 18 hours a day. Go, Ugh. <laughs> go for it. I made that mistake. Go for it, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Made, that, made that mistake. Mm -hmm. Which really equips me to help people prevent from making that mistake now. Right. Because I, because I did that. Talk and, about uh, burnout. <laughs> yeah. Complete burnout. Mm -hmm. And then you resent your team and you hate your fucking company. And, and never mind the personal sacrifices mm -hmm. that I was, you know, making. Um, by doing that, right? It was I was sacrificing so many things. Uh, the true story: if I showed you a picture of me from 2015, 2016, I look older than I do now. I find that to be impossible. It's I'm staring at you right now. Impossible. <laughs> very impossible. Very old. Very, I know. I, I look older. <laughs> very possible. <clears throat> because I had put myself in this position of performance punishment. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, well, I have to do this. I just delegated, uh, back to task delegation, like we were talking about. I was just delegating tasks, um, service technician, install, whatever. And I was doing everything else. And uh, there's a lot of other shit that needs to be done. Man. One of the, th because one of the things I neglected was the value of the hour mm -hmm. that I needed to be focused on. Right. You know, you're out there doing shit that generates a hundred bucks when you should be out there doing shit that generates a thousand. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And getting caught in that wheel, you know, that hamster wheel of, of this 
it, it's at a tremendous detriment. Mm -hmm. it just like I have to warn people if you if you have the capacity to recognize that this is going on in your company, if you don't course correct it, it is detrimental mm -hmm. to health, finances, culture, clients, branding, mm -hmm. everything. It is completely detrimental to what you're trying to build. So you need to evaluate, like you said, evaluate the, evaluate the operation, evaluate perform, pull your fucking head out of the weeds and, and your ass and, and go, okay, am I, am I depending on this individual for too much? Am I depending on myself for too much? If you, if it's you and one other person, <coughs> excuse me, goddamn. So I do lean back into the microphone yeah, for the like, second half of that. I just have it. That one just kind of snuck out on me. I <laughs> couldn't bulge in there. Uh, I think the day quill's wearing off. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, if, if you have a small company of you and one other person or two other people, this still applies. You just have to make sure that when things are being done, that there's a clear understanding from both parties as to how and why. And that, that, that you guys have that marriage, you know, going into it mm -hmm. and that you're not just completely relying on that person to do this un, without question. Right. Which is the role that is often played. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, here, go do this job. Go rough this in. Go take care of this. Go do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I got to work on this today. And then it starts to create that that separation. So mm -hmm. you got to be careful. So thank you, Sonny, for sending sending me this and like you said there'd probably be a part two when uh my brain remembers what the fuck i was going to talk about it'll be you'll create some other episode off of it i'm sure well and, and i'm already kind of thinking about that because one of the conversations i want to have too is is leadership equity mm. um what that looks like building that moving forward um and then how to what happens when you spin that mm. um and, and this, i think this is a, kind of a good segue into that conversation coming up as well but um, but anyway, that's that's what I've got. You got anything else? No, I'm good. Did you eat all those cough drops? Yep, every last one of them. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I'm gonna get diabetes from these fucking things. God damn it, dude! Oh. I sound like I got kicked in the fucking throat. Like, yeah. Um, I want to give a shout out to Well.com. Yeah, that fucking episode was a lot of fun. I thought Bo, mm -hmm. who so he's the podcast host. Guys, if you haven't listened to the interview, Nate and I were guests on Well.com. What was it? Asking for help with the trace mixers. Yep. Uh, I got a compliment, Bo. I thought he did a really good job of interviewing, navigating the conversation, asking really good questions. Mm -hmm. And that conversation actually created a working relationship between me and him, which I thought was a great compliment. Mm -hmm. So go over to well.com and check that podcast out. Uh, I've got another one coming out where they had invited me on. Can't tell you yet because I don't have their permission. I don't know when it's coming, uh, but that is. Uh, Probably when it starts breathing heavy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's going to take a couple people a little bit to get that bit. one. That's going to be one of those hand grenade jokes. You know? <laughs> Just throw it out there and wait a minute. Uh, Who's going to get yeah. it? Mostly no one. But um, but yeah, check that out. <clears throat> Go and, and check out the, the whole well.com. They do, they have all kinds of stuff going mm -hmm. on from instructional videos. I think they have, they may have their own app now. I'm not sure. But yeah, I know it was in the development. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot going on. That is a, it is a welding podcast. I like this one. <laughs> <laughs> what a fool me. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! Uh, but uh, yeah, Nate and I had the privilege of of being a guest on their show, so go check that out. You can find Nate on Instagram at nate newton eighty seven. I am on Instagram at the Tradesman Experience. Email is the Tradesman Experience at gmail .com. Website is the Tradesman Experience .com. and the YouTube channel is the Tradesman Experience. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Get out there, get shit done. Be proud to be a tradesman. See ya. <laughs>